Yeah. 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 I tell you, I mean, I've taught so many classes online. I was just thinking, I was like, I need to go back and watch this for the comments I'm going to comment on. I was like, wait, wait a minute. Oh, I reminded you in everything. I feel like I'm. Oh, Jordan, mm -hmm. I am so sorry. You guys are going to start getting really PO'd at me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't do the videos at the night. And, oh, my God. Okay, I got to get my link neck you together can send us of the audio, though. What? Like, can we get access to the audio? Oh, yeah, then? they send me the audio. Yeah. I'll okay. send that to you. Bravo. Thank you, Alexis. I never knew why they sent both of them, frankly. <laughs> now I know. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ryan. Oh, uh, I was just saying that like sometimes like getting revenge doesn't always make us happy. And maybe it's just like a momentary thing. And also sometimes it also doesn't give us peace because it takes us back to the same mind frame or the same mindset that we had when we first did that revenge. Um, I choose... Sometimes I have a short temper, to be honest. I have a hard time sometimes with forgiveness. And trust me, I pray to Jesus every day to give me compassion and forgiveness. So <laughs> I do. That's in my daily prayer. And But in the Bible, it does tell, there is like a quote, which I really love. Like the verse, it was, um, if somebody hits your cheek, give them the other cheek to hit. Yeah. And so for me, I try and live by that because the Bible also says like, what you, how you judge other people is how you'll be judged. And so I try to make sure that I'm understanding because not everybody has the same background as me. Not everybody has the same experiences. And maybe when something seems so clear, like, hey, that was totally messed up, but then they don't even realize it. And sometimes I just have to remember and have compassion that like, you know, like maybe my upbringing allowed me to do that, but maybe they didn't have that opportunity to grow as a person or whatever it may be. Can I add to that? Sure. Because as soon as she said something, it reminded me of a moment where me and Ryan were in the same situation, but we both reacted differently. So we were on the soccer field and we were playing against Columbia, like one of those top schools, and Ryan got kicked in the face. Like she got kicked in the face like four or five times that game. So you see Ryan, she's like, She's like, cool, she's calm. She's like, she's like, let's just keep playing the game. Don't worry about it. And then see, you see me in the corner cussing out the ref, cussing out the players. I'm getting angry for her. I'm like about to throw hands. And Ryan's just like, it's all good, Lex. Don't worry about it. Keep on going, keep playing the game. And I'm over here like, no, I'm about to get kicked out because this is not okay. <laughs> Jordan's like, not me, me. How do you kick <laughs> like, someone in the face? I mean- because Ryan's the keeper and she's the only one allowed to hold the ball. So when she holds the ball, she holds it right in front of her face, like a little knucklehead, as coach called her. And so they were kicking at her face, trying to get the ball from her. That's awful. I practically assaulted on the field, like literally borderline assaulted. I literally got gutted. The girl yes. slipped through my stomach and I already had the ball. It was really bad. They were just mad that we were like at – because they're like a top school and so I and think we were like tied at the time because we're like fourth and I think they thought that like it was going to be an easier game so yeah basically got gutted yeah okay it was bad. okay but um that like what they were talking about reminds me of like I don't know sorry I had I had an idea at the top of this but I just got distracted by <laughs> getting assaulted not be me but like like in Jewish faith um there's no non-existence of hell. Like hell doesn't exist. Uh, they believe that hell is on earth. Like our time here is our penance. So um, that's a lot of time when revenge, like oh, for millennia have been kind of the short of the stick. Like we, we have, we were slain, we had the Holocaust, you know, so on and so forth. But they always think that it's good to turn the other cheek because if we don't, what make us? um I think that's a good sentient or, or sentiment but at the same time I have a hard time turning the other cheek whenever someone talks out their mouth to me like I don't know how to you know correlate with 
this is like maybe the be better thing to do, but this is not what human psychology wants me to do. And the same thing with like when you vent to other people, it's not good for you like psychologically because it just gets you to think about the scenario you were in and get you hyped up about that thing again. What's better is to talk it out, like find out good solutions that will actually help you. But people don't really want to do that. I know I like to vent whenever something happens to me. I don't necessarily want to hear other people tell me like, oh, well, maybe this is like what you should do. But like, that's oftentimes what you need to do. I think that's kind of what, Mc like what he was getting at, which is while revenge may be the easier path, it's not always the best path. Well, trauma, trauma is a really serious problem, right? So that's what the bullies experience trauma. And if you don't work through your trauma, right you're gonna you're gonna explode um does that make sense to people and so um so i mean when when children grow up in toxic environments they experience trauma i know that arkansas is number one in childhood traumatic experiences and you know how do we I, I do think we've got to think of this as a, as a systemic problem. And even though we can't address, you know, we're not going to solve it, at least we should address it because it does have this very toxic long-term effect. Um, so just like where, I mean, when McCullough talks about Bud McVeigh could forgive because he had confidence that the system was going to put these people in prison forever right what do we do when we don't we have relationships like between police officers and black men where neither one has any trust there's a complete breakdown what are you going to do to prevent this cycle because that is a big problem right you would say black lives matter and some people were were trying to take that the lesson is that there's these systemic problems we've got to work on the system and the way it works um so i just present that to you as an issue that is uh registers very deep in our psyche it's a survival thing how do you take a society that is as wealthy as our society and has so many people triggering survival instinct all the time is that because we are basically depending on competition and adversity and we have this view it's a dog eat dog world and we set people up for being this way and then somebody else is going to fight back i'm going to prove to you oh it, rather than cooperative right how do we want to structure our society and so he's saying given physiology we have a capacity for both cooperation and adversity um yeah okay right that's right i mean it 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 is it's very complicated right and it's difficult um uh let's see colin do you have a response Um, I don't know if there's a way to break it that's um, feasible because like the whole idea of like, you know, talk about the monkeys, it's sometimes for like their own protection. And the only reason that we're like seen as top of the food chain now is because of the weapons that we've made and things of that nature so he referenced like a monkey story where he was like um he saw two chimpanzees they were like living together and one hurt the other one and uh he waited to take revenge on the other but well, okay but even weapons people will some people think weapons are the best way to prevent war right and so it doesn't mean you have to use them <laughs> right um yeah. plus if you use them in the wrong way 
you just trigger revenge. That's how we got World War II, is that the peace treaty was too vengeful. Comment and, on that, yeah. it creates a, what you were talking about earlier, which is child soldiers, because to like what in the, the situation in the Middle East, what they see is imperialism, us coming in, taking over, and their fathers or their mothers getting killed. And so what else, what other solution is there to them? You're an invader in their home, even though in our mindset, we're preventing, you know, various different things, but them, it's not like that. Same with Vietnam. We went in there that we were doing like the best thing possible, lost thousands of lives on both sides to no real end. Like nothing really came of that. And I think like, weapons as a deterrence isn't really applicable because it just creates more enemies. All right. So the other issue here is political rhetoric that politicians are very good at punching the fear button and interpreting situations in different ways, right? So were we protecting the world from communism or were we engaged in imperialism, right? Uh, okay, then you have to, you know, you have to do some research to find out what's going on and different people had different motives. But it seems to me that if you just give up and say, uh, revenge, that's part of life, you're just going to get worse and worse. And um, on the other hand, you can't forgive everything, but that's not usually the problem. Usually people tend to overreact with revenge. And the last point I'm gonna make is that all these school shootings or all these mass shootings, like we have many, many mass shootings in the news now. And each one you could go and find out, well, what's the motive of the shooter? And is this being fostered by social, by the way we're structuring our society? Is it nurturing that kind of stuff? Or is it trying to prevent that kind of stuff? And after Black Lives Matter, did we really set things up better? Or do, have we had a reaction where it's just as bad or worse? Um, and I'm not, I don't even have clear ideas in the back of my mind, but I do think we do need to address these things. And some people will decide that's what they want to specialize in. And then they should be interviewed and they, their books should be read because some people just know more than other people about stuff that really affects all of us. Um, all right, the next one's depression. Um, so first I will go to the outline. Um, depression as a spiritual problem. Um, oh, sorry. Where'd it go? There we go. The soul in depression. Um, and this is people just losing any vitality for life. Um, and uh, this was actually ancient people were understood depression. Augustine uh, stigmatized it. If you get depressed, you're guilty, it's your fault you have some the devil in you or something like that. Um, Mr. Solomon was raised uh, Jewish. He's, he was one of the people in the, in the article. He was raised strict Jewish, but for him, it's, it's reassuring. So for Mr. Newland, it was depressing. <laughs> he had to get over it. It was obsessional thoughts. For Mr. Solomon, it's a sense of structure. There's logic in the world, even if he was depressed. So, um, uh, all right. So we have all these diagnoses, right? We have the physiology of it, but Parker Palmer, um, these people are also talking about it as a religious, spiritual experience. And in order to get over depression, you have to find your vibe. You have to find what you're living for, something greater than yourself, it, ultimately, in order to get over it. Um, all right. All right. So did who read the article on depression? 
Okay, Michael, what did you think? Um, so I, I liked, well, I didn't like, but I found it interesting um, when he made the comment that depression is the flaw in love and then discussed kind of like the mood spectrum and how like, um, like without depression, you can't have love and kind of vice versa, um, which you had on your little thing as well. Um, which kind of, I think, goes, can kind of ties back to the Biology of the Spirit article um, when we were talking about like how, like we, we kind of do have to have chaos, um, but kind of like the, um, I don't know, just the importance of, of, both, of both sides and of having kind of an equilibrium, I suppose. Anybody else read it? Okay, so three people have anybody? Oh, I, I did read it. I mean, I think that that's an interesting concept. The depression is kind of like the antithesis to love. I don't necessarily see that because I, I hate the concept that if you can't love yourself, you can't love anyone else because that's just simply not true. If anything, my love of other people makes me love myself more. Um, I think it makes it harder to see the genuineness in other people and genuineness and like love, but I don't think they're like antithesis of each other. Okay. Um, let's see. So depression was a problem during COVID for a number of people, right? Um, anybody have an idea of what the causes of it was? Was it just that people couldn't physically move and relate to other people? And so the energy just like that? I think that's part of it. I think we're social creatures. I right. think that we need other human interaction in order to feel better. I mean, that, that's just human people, like whether you're introverted or extroverted. I also think there's an idea of like people find it hard to relate to a box and that's like a computer screen or like a phone screen. So it's a lot harder to have like what you feel like a genuine human connection to other people through those things. Yeah, like I have my classes, you know, and I, it seems like we're talking, but then I see, I go, I go to campus, I'll be there next September for a, a week, August, I mean, and I see the real person, I was like, wow, you can hardly even recognize them, but you know that if the class, if you had had all the body language and the whole person, it would have been a different class, um, does that make sense to people? Um, I was just going to chime in and agree with Jordan. I think that like, obviously the social isolation was like a huge point, um, but also just like, um, like even, especially if you relate it to like biological um, reasons to fall into depression, like not being able to like necessarily go exercise. Like a lot of people, like myself included, I rely on going to the gym and like exercising for my mental health. Um, and like, there were, there were a lot of those things that also like, you just, did, you couldn't do anymore you know, as far as reasons of why it increased. Yeah, so um, let's see, I do have a, a Newland quote here also from on the article on depression. Um, let's see, where's the search button? Here we go. Um, Here we go. Support for On Being with Krista Tippett comes from the Fetzer Institute of the World. Learn more by Phil Territory. And that is much harder to speak about and can only lecture for the end. Let's see, I'm going go to go You go to a priest or a minister. Spiritual life itself. Going into my experience and fragrant, you can't really feel any of that in your bottom. They can come around and simply report from time to time what he was sort of intuiting about my condition. Somehow he found the one place in my body, namely the soles of my feet, where I could experience some sort of connection to another human being. Mm -hmm. And the act of massaging just you know, in a way that I really don't have words for kept me connected with the human race. What do you mainly did for me, of course, was to be willing 
to be present to me in my suffering. He just hung in with me in this very quiet, very simple, very tactile way. And uh, I've never really been able to find the words to fully express my gratitude for that. But I know it made a huge difference. And it became for me a metaphor of the kind of community we need to extend to people who are suffering in this way, which is a, a community that is neither invasive of the mystery nor evasive of the suffering, but is willing to hold people in a in a space, a sacred space of relationship, where somehow this person who is on the dark side of the moon can get a little confidence that um, they can come around to the other side. My mother would say things like, I talk to God, I talk directly to God, and he answers me. And, and I always sort of had the image when I was a child that, <laughs> that God was this, you know, sort of old man, half shaven in a bathrobe, um, who had a direct phone line to Sylvia, my mother. Um, <laughs> But, but didn't do very much to help her. <laughs> I, was always, I thought, you know, if she has such a direct line, why doesn't he make her better? Um, and what I was told about my mother being in bed so much was that she had warts on her feet. It was kind of an odd thing to have been taught. And the warts had a wonderful name. They had an Italian name. It was a Verruca, uh -huh. um, which to me sounded kind of like a Hebrew prayer, Baruch <laughs> and, and so I was sort of fascinated with the word, but I would sit outside my, the door to my mother's bedroom and I would hear her crying or, or, or just sort of wait for her to wake up and, and um, that was very much the experience of my childhood. I, I remember even a very strong sort of sensation walking through the door. We lived in an apartment during that middle part of my childhood um, from okay. the time I was about seven to ten. And I remember walking through. All right. So one more, the one on stress. Um, oh, come on. Okay. Um, oh, come on. Um, there we go. All right. And it comes to the stressful event mm -hmm. and your physiological response that you recognize as stress. Dictionary of virtually every country. Yes. So that when I was in Japan last year, I asked this audience um, of mostly Japanese speakers, how do you say stress in Japanese? And they said stress. <laughs> so I said, well, I guess I speak Japanese, but it's in every dictionary. And he was very um, aggressive in doing this. And, and the sad thing about it was, uh, he also talked to the lay public a lot. And the lay public, of course, loved this. And as a result, his colleagues um, really disparaged him. Because in those days, and up until very recently, scientists talking to the lay public was, was considered... Um, and we're th this is sort of mid... Mid-19th mid century, yeah, mid century. Yeah, mid-century. 1940s, 1940s. I mean, I spent a lot of the 80s in Germany, and, uh -huh. and I remember, as I read your book, I remember Der Stress. Yes, yes, Der Stress. <laughs> and that's very stressy. <laughs> that's um, but I guess also what's fascinating to me about that is that that human beings experienced what we now call stress forever. Oh, yeah. I mean, we know this biochemically, but we also just know that it's well, in the nature of being human, but we didn't have a word for it in any language. Well, it was called different things. So, um, in the 19th century, it was called nervousness. Okay. And right, actually, there right. was a quote that George M. Beard in the 1880s said that the principal cause of nervousness in modern civilization, there are five causes, uh, the periodical press, the telegraph, um, <laughs> the, steam the steam railroads, uh -huh. the sciences, and the mental activity of women. <laughs> 
so so people have perceived the things as stressful for a very long time and actually this is a really it's, it's not being facetious but what he was describing was the stress of the industrial revolution uh -huh. and you could transpose all of those pieces to right. today fill in the blanks right the media uh -huh. sorry about that <laughs> Um, the internet, uh -huh. a constant connection with the with cell phones, uh -huh. and I think what he was talking about, and the sciences, because there's all this unknown, oh, and, and fear all of these, of events. all the also ethical uh, dilemmas right. being exactly. presented by cutting edge science right. that people are facing in the same same offices. thing yeah. exactly. And the mental activity of women, I think what he was talking about is the social change right. that comes along with technological change, especially rapid technological change. And so it's really we're living in an information age now but why is it that these things are stressful because change novelty is one of the most potent triggers of the stress response and that's a good thing because when an animal finds itself in a new environment so if a field mouse wanders into a new field if it didn't have a stress response, if it wouldn't suddenly sit up and look around and become vigilant and focused and ready to fight or flee, if it just went to sleep, it would get eaten by the next cat that came along, right? So you need your stress response to survive and novelty must therefore trigger the stress response. So the problem happens when the stress response goes on too long, mm -hmm. when it's active, when it shouldn't be active, when you're pumping out these hormones and nerve chemicals at max and that's when you get sick and that's when these chemicals and hormones have an effect on the immune system and change its ability to fight disease okay so um oh sorry so when we what i want to link this to uh, the back to the themes of the class um which is the relation between science and spirituality because esther sternberg was originally uh, a, a traditional scientist and she separated emotions from your physical health so you just cure the body you don't have to cure the soul um but what she or her experience drew her to a whole different orientation to a much more holistic orientation. Um, so science today is much more aware that feelings are caused by biological connections and um, and feelings to cause biological connections too. The, there's a positive pur purpose, right? But then it goes too far. So in her case, she was trying to finish an article about some science thing. She was always arguing with her mother because her mother always wanted her to value religion more. And she wanted to be the objective scientist. And then um, she was trying to write her article about science and her mother was dying. So she was in the hospital and pretty soon her stress response just wouldn't stop. And that's when she, um, she realized it's making me sick. And she took some time off. She went to a temple at Crete, the god of healing, the son of Apollo, and she actually got better. But, um, okay, her argument with her mother, the brain research is showing that humans have always experienced it. It's part of the brain. It's a very primitive part of the brain. Um, change triggers the response stressful circumstances trigger the response people need to become more self-consciously aware um, but give themselves permission to take care of themselves prevent messing up their stress response the other thing that uh, the people in this research field are are discovering more and more is the importance of the arts for healing so the arts are not superficial. They're very integrated into our psyche. We need art. We need poetry, music, dance um, in order to have balanced lives and in order to get well if they get out of balance. Um, you want to know one of the only uh, seen way to improve people who have dementia is by playing music from their youth. 
Yeah. Uh, it's one of the few ways that the neural pathways will still connect is by music. Actually, I when my mother was in the nursing home, I play the flute and I'm pretty bad. I'm telling you, I'm not very good. But I used to take my flute up there and play. It's a Methodist home. So I got out my Methodist hymn book. <laughs> and um, my gosh, these these people who were just sort of, you know, uh, you, no response. Like one of them started beating out the rhythm of the music and they just lit up. Uh, and then I would play Christmas carols. And really, you'd see these people just lighting up. And I thought, well, that must be my purpose for ever learning to play the flute, because I was never very good at it. But I always could go and light up the, the old people's minds. So that was really interesting. And that's just, we, during the Enlightenment, we thought the psyche was a blank slate and we were going to remold it, and make everybody good. And that just hasn't worked out. Um, and the arts were also trivialized. It was like leisure time activity. But now, you know, we're the discoveries that it's much more integrated is the, the place of the arts are very important. And the arts were always important in ancient cultures. It was a sensuous way to get to the spiritual life. So the artists were dedicated to creating churches or temples. Uh, all the artistic talent was dedicated to spirituality. And then it got trivialized in the modern era. So um, I, would, I would ask you to you know, stay, stay aware of that. I remember there was a time in my life we didn't have much money and um, I didn't go to concerts. I just, the arts disappeared. And I realized later that that was not smart. Um, she looked back, she could figure out why her parents were the way they were. They just appreciated sitting out in quiet because of what they lived through. And there's lots of techniques. And when you do those, engage in those, you change how your immune system works. Um, and since 9-11, well, since COVID, since the economic downturn in 2008. So people, you know, are having to figure out how to deal with their stress. Um, how, how are we reacting to it? And the worst thing to do is to find someone to blame, right? For something, for something that's making you feel bad. Um, so I would like each of you to talk a little bit about if you can't talk about the article, something about how you think stress is affecting our culture in multiple ways. Okay, Michael. Oh, Tim, go ahead, Tim. Well, I was gonna say stress is like hurting us because more and more people who are working now a lot of people are getting stressed because the hours and stuff. And also like when COVID hit, it was pretty stressful for some families because some people were dying. Some people didn't have a job for a while. So like stress hit real hard. Then it got a little better, but it's it's not like perfect. You know what I'm saying? So it kind of hurts the economy a little bit because it takes everybody's time out of the day to kind of go through stuff. It's hard to go through and like work efficiently when you're stressed out. Everybody should be able to have something to say. Is it, is it, does the society set up to make it worse or is, are there setups to make it better or how, what evidence do you have that it's affecting the culture? Go ahead. I think it's- um, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. My bad. I think it's almost worse now simply because like the grind mindset, like if you're not suffering, then you're not really working. I think that's so detrimental to people. The idea that your entire life should be your job 
is really like hard for people, especially during the lockdown, where it was kind of like intermingled between your home life and your work life. People need that separation. They need to be like, this is my work and this is who I am as a person. Your entire life shouldn't be your job. I think that it leads to a lot of people to, you know, they think that if you're not if you're not working 24 seven, then you're not doing enough. And I think that's part of the issue, like our culture today. I don't want to cut off Zane. you can go right after. I just wanted to add that like the whole, like I grew up on the thought process of work hard, play hard. I'm working so I can play hard. I'm not playing, I'm not playing light so I can work harder. That's not my mindset. And I think a lot of us forgot that and it really needs to be reminded to us. There's a, not to be a, such a social media person, but there's a TikToker and she constantly goes about how in her like work setting, people are asking her to do extra work. Like there's this one scene where she goes, her boss is asking her to put in some extra time after work because they're low on staff. And she goes, I'm willing to put in 15 minutes after after work today to help get work done. And her boss goes, okay, can you do that for the rest of the week and until we solve the situation? And she goes, no, this is the acceptance, not the standard. My, my time is not gonna, my off time is not gonna be taken away because of your lack of planning. And she like ends the Zoom call. And I was like, that's such, a mindset that most of us need to have nowadays because we've gotten so oh well it's just an extra 15 minutes per day it's whatever um yeah um I was gonna say like kind of uh expectations that people have and I mean I know personally I've kind of struggled with this is like I hate letting people down I mean there's you know, there's that stress factor there that you want to work hard and you want to do all these things and you want to make everybody happy and be a, I mean, I'm a people pleaser. I know that, but, uh, uh, yeah, just that added stress. Um, I think there's good stress too, but I mean, just kind of it all piling on is obviously not that good, but I think today, like people just like all the expectations that are out there, I think it makes it worse. Yeah, I think, can you hear me? Sorry. Um, just, that made me think, and also when we were talking about like depression and COVID and stuff, it reminded me of this quote of comparison is a thief of all joy. And like, really? how, like comparison is a thief of all joy. And so that kind of reminds me of like expectations, like expectations for ourselves, perhaps. Like when we look at like, I am trying to do this thing where I'm not on social media as much. I And the fact that I have to like put a timer on my phone to remind me that I'm on it for like one minute to 15 minutes is absurd but I just realized that going through social media seeing that like like the idea of traveling and that's literally their work like traveling every day but being a social media influencer pays their bills and then I'm like wait what did I do to not deserve that you know it's like and I look at people like Addison Ray, who never has to work a day in their life and people that like did I'm not gonna say did nothing to get where they're at but just made it lucky or they were put in the position where they were rich already and they had their family supporting them, pushed it, and now they're pumping products. So maybe those, those companies promoted them. So we never know what's going on behind the scenes, but I'm just feeling like that comparison brings, our, like, brings you down. And like, it's kind of inevitable when you're going on social media all the time and it's so common nowadays. And I, it wasn't really... No, literally, like we don't realize what's going on behind the scenes. And so I just feel like um, when we're on social media all the time or when we see other people who has jobs that maybe we wish we could have, but realistically we can't, like a lot of us, we're going to college so we can have the opportunity to get a good job, right? But then some people don't even need to go to college to get a good job and get paid millions of dollars to go in for hotels, you know, and things like that. So um, I just think comparison is like something that we have to deal with. I think that's why you should find something you're passionate about um, because then, you know, you'll get that pleasure response. Although even then there's a lot of stuff you have to do that you don't want to do, but it's still at the end of the day, you can feel like this is what I want. Um, because if you go into something that you're doing because somebody else expects it or something, 
and then you have to put up with the usual everything junk. Um, I, I just think that's when people have a midlife crisis and they wonder what the heck am I doing, right? Um, so I do think you should find something you think is worthwhile and also that contributes to the society because you can't ignore people your whole life, right? They're right in front of you. Um, yeah. It's like the idea of like living to work or you work to live. Like a lot of people live, I heard like the story of this guy who like literally just worked so that he could have just enough money to like sustain himself. And he lives in like some forest or something, but he said he's so happy and he loves life, but he doesn't like do anything else other than just survive. And so I, I'm glad that what I'm going into is something I'm super passionate about, but I totally agree because if we're just, and again, it goes to balance, right? Because if we talked about how money gives us opportunity to be happy. We have to look at one aspect, the balance of having to, well, for me, at least, I have to look at what pays well, or at least to fit with the lifestyle that I need, that I know I need to be happy, but then also do something fulfilling for the soul because it's a balance if I don't have both then for me personally I just know I won't be very happy so yeah I think most people the research is that people are happier if they think their jobs are helping other people um, and believe it or not I actually thought teaching philosophy would help people but <laughs> I realized not very many people would think that but I did very deeply um, Anyway, uh, thanks, Ryan. But <laughs> Colin, what do you think? On stress or depression? Either one. Um, I think depression is... <sighs> and something that's underrated per se, um, especially for men. I think men's mental health in general is underrated. I know it's a weird thing to say, but most suicides in the United States are men and things of that nature. So there's this... kind of but it just in general depression isn't like it's a simple talk everyone hears about it and that's the end of it but well, probably if you asked what percent of men do you think get depressed people would be way off is that what you're getting at yeah right and most people think they're alone in it and they don't realize that there's other people who have it and are succeeding with it. Like it's not a hindrance. It's just something that you have to work through. Um, okay, so I'll just wrap this up. Um, so the main theme here is the, you know, the need for integrity and the complexity of it. But also you can look at our society. Does our society really aim for maximizing human flourishing? Or does our society set people up for trouble? Um, and then what uh, Ryan said about the grind, right? Um, that if we have a history of Puritanism, which is anti-sensuous, right? The body is nasty. And then we have a Puritan work ethic. So you, instead of having pleasure, you work harder to make money. So that is built into our culture. Uh, and I do think it's, it's taking a toll, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? Um, but race, class, gender, these things just keep aggravating it. Question is, are we doing anything to, as legislators, and that's the next section of the class is that how do we govern well? What sort of laws and policies, institutions, what kind of leaders? Because, so the next issue is what's the relationship between these personal issues 
and political issues. Obviously, mass shootings are going to cause stress, but that's kind of trivial, right? Um, how did we get to that point where we have them? All right, so I'll let you go and we'll see you tomorrow. Any questions? And with, uh, Alexis, you can write me an email right now. Dr. Beck, make that video for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, you know, just mentioning it, I'm hoping that'll help but not necessarily knowing me. All right, we'll see you. Bye -bye. Wait a bit. I, I do have to. <laughs>